Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with somebody that I grew up looking, looking up to. Uh, he was like the Tiger Woods of <laughs> tennis back in that day. He always was prim and collar shirt, button nice to the top, creases in his shorts. My dad was like, that's the kind of man you need to be. Uh, <laughs> we watched him on a magical run to Wimbledon uh, and then watched him coach Malavi of Washington. He's the only coach to win a men's and a women's singles uh, um, NCAA title. Uh, we are here with the man, the myth, the legend, and the proud father of an NCAA champion, Brian Shelton. Brian, thanks for coming on. Come out. Thanks for having me, man. I uh, mutual respect. You know, I know how much you've done for the game and for for a lot of players, uh, but for the game in general. And I appreciate what you do. So tell me, because you know, you grew up in Alabama, and I've been to the South. Matter of fact, I had. I have an Alabama story. I was coaching a player. We were playing in the Dauphin 25K, oh, yeah. okay. trying to get the wild card to the US, uh, to the French Open, okay. and had a stroke in Dauphin, Alabama. <laughs> and I just remember going into the hospital like, I got to get out of Dauphin, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about being a black man growing up playing tennis in Alabama. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's just truly a blessing that I'm here today, you know, um, having done what I've done and, and had the opportunities that I've had when it started, like you said, in Alabama, where the opportunities weren't plentiful. Um, I can remember Kamau going to a tournament in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, when I was probably 12 or 13 years old and winning the tournament. Next year, I wasn't able to play. They wouldn't let me in. They would not let me in. They didn't know the color of my skin when I went there the first time, but the second time they knew. And they said, no, you don't have an invitation to come play here. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I tell people all the time, you know, it was interesting traveling through the South back in the 70s. And uh, you, you understand those stairs and what those stairs mean, you know. And it's like, what you doing around here? You're not right. supposed to be here. You know, and and to have that feeling like you're just not not welcomed all the time. And but I was fortunate, Kamal. I got unbelievable parents, mom and dad. My mom was the one who traveled with me, you know, in the juniors and took me to all those places. And she held her head high, man. <laughs> she held her head high and she didn't back down, you know, and she was the one that had the strength to say, hey, we're here and we're going to play. And you're going to have these opportunities and we're not going to back down. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to do it with class. You know, Arthur for me was the guy, you know, you're talking about looking at me. I looked at Arthur and I saw this guy who transcended tennis and everything else and sports. And this guy had a voice. He had a platform and he came way before I did. So to be able to see what he did to lead Davis cup teams and, and be the, the face of American tennis as a black man, uh, that said it all to me. And I said, well, if this guy can, can push through all these barriers, you know, I can, I can survive through the South a little bit. And, and honestly, Kamal, uh, where I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, there are a lot of good people, a lot of good people that supported me. Uh, I had a coach that was, to me, the best guy in the world um, in Bill Tim. Uh, I had a community there that supported me. Um, and so I had plenty of backing there in the South too. So it wasn't all closed doors. Mm. Uh, there had to be some that we, that we had to push open a little bit, but uh, overall I had a great experience. Now, how did you afford it? Because, you know, like I know when I was coming up and my parents were okay, my dad was a lawyer, my mom was a, a teacher mm. and an assistant principal. So I wasn't starving, but even a middle-class family and I had three siblings that played other sports. My brother played basketball. My sister played volleyball. My younger sister swam and ran track. So yeah. logistically, it was harder than it was financially. Yeah. Uh, but even if you're okay, every parent reaches a point where it's like, yeah, I'm only willing to invest this much. Yeah. And that coach comes and says, yeah, but you need to invest this much because he needs yeah. to go here. 
Right. How did you, and that's when like the local doctors, the local lawyers, the guys at the club, the village sort of forms around you to kick in 50, a hundred bucks, or even yeah. just give you a ride and take you to the tournament. Yeah. Yeah. If your dad has to go to court, right? So mm -hmm. how, how did you afford that, all that? Yeah, that's, that's great because that's, that's exactly what happened in my case. You know, my parents, you know, come from modest means. Uh, my dad was in the army. So he made a career out of the army and he, he wasn't a, an officer. He was an enlisted guy. So he went in at 18 years old, mm. wanted a better life for his family. And so, you know, I didn't come from a generation of, of people that had gone to university and college and were well-educated. And so my parents wanted something better for their children. I've got two brothers and an older sister. And uh, if people in the community didn't step in a little bit to help, um, there's a guy named uh, Horace Grant, who, who really stepped in in Huntsville, Alabama and, and really kind of helped us get to a few more tournaments to go play. Got, got some people together to put in a few hundred dollars, like go, go get there and, and get some matches and then come back. Like I said, I had a coach that was willing to not charge, you know, for every lesson. Yep. And so he put some carrots out there. He said, you accomplish this and this, you can come to these clinics for free. Right. We had to do something for it. So I, I cleaned some bathrooms and, and did some things around the club and stuff like that to kind of yeah. earn it a little bit too. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't all just handed to me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we understood the value of a dollar, man. And the guy who worked at the restaurant in the club, I come up to him, no one would be around. He'd slip me a little plate of food, you know, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and let me eat, you know, right, without, right. without charging me. Um, so there's a lot of little things that people did along the way that allowed me to continue to do the things that I want to do to continue to, to develop and get better as a tennis player. And so without that, without a mom that was willing to, you know, she was in charge of the bills. So she would just hold out paying some bills at key times. And so that I go play another tournament so I could, you know, afford to do a couple things. And she'd find a way somehow to make it all happen, make it all add up and uh but sacrifice 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 i had a newspaper route my sister and i and we'd be out there early in the morning delivering papers you know and mm. just finding a way to make a little bit of change so that we could keep going that money didn't go in my account it, it went in the tennis fund you know and so we just found ways to, to make it happen so how'd you choose georgia tech because you know i always find it interesting that people have that short list Right. And in men's tennis, a lot of people don't know. Well, you know, you get four and a half to fill a team of eight girls. You get eight to fill a team of eight. And so a lot of guys say, oh, they offered me 70 percent. So I'm going to hold out. Right. Then they end up giving <laughs> giving that 70 percent to somebody else and you lose your spot. You know what I mean? Right. I remember right. my senior year deciding on where I was going to go. I was like, yeah, I really want to go here. But they only offered me half. I'm going to hold out a little bit. and You miss your opportunity. So how did you decide on Georgia Tech and what was option number two? So, you know, I actually committed to a small school in, in San Antonio, Texas, Trinity. And mm. at the time, Trinity was a top five tennis school. So, I mean, we, we're talking about Bob McKinley, who you probably know. Uh, Bob McKinley, he was the coach there at the time. And him and his brother, Chuck, I mean, these guys were, were amazing tennis players. And... Uh, so he was there, he had developed a great program. I committed to going to school there. I was looking at Duke, I was looking at Illinois, I was looking at some schools around the country, uh, but I settled on Trinity. And uh, probably four or five months before I was supposed to go, he resigned. So all of a sudden they were, they were kind of up in arms what they were gonna do with the program. This is a small school, two to 3,000 students. The only sport that they had that had athletic scholarships was men's tennis. And so there was, it was in jeopardy of, of them losing that, those scholarships. And so I said, you know, I gotta take a, take a look at some other schools. And a guy named Gary Groleman was at Georgia Tech at the time who played at Stanford. And uh, he started recruiting me and my best friend, Kenny Thorne. And uh, we, we ended up taking a late visit there. Um, and next thing I knew, I said, okay, I'm going to Georgia Tech. I guess I'm going to be an engineer, you know? And, and uh, they say, you know, I'm a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. So, you know, I was good in math and science, thank goodness, because it's intensive. And uh, 
I mean, there you don't graduate, you get out. You right. know? Once you once you get that degree, you get out because because it's no joke. Uh, I remember the first day of orientation, the guy said, look to the left and to the right. At least one of those won't be here when you graduate, right. you know, and so it was it was uh, it was intense. But what a great education. So you were uh, ACC player of the year. Yeah doesn't necessarily translate into professional success, but you had a good professional career. When did you know you wanted to go pro? Because without, let's say, winning NCAAs twice in a row, there really is like, it's always a gamble. And it's kind of like, eh, I'm at a great school. I get a great job. Do I really want to go sleep in the car and play in 10 and 15 Ks in Peoria, right? Yeah. Uh, so when did you know that was what you wanted to do and what when or what sort of triggered like, damn, I could do this? Yeah, well, I mean, I knew I wanted that at a, at a much earlier stage. You know, I remember my coach would always make us watch the tapes of McEnroe and Borg at Wimbledon. You know, those epic matches that they had. There was one that was like 18, 16 in the tiebreaker and just craziness. Um, so at a young age, I was like, man, I want to do this, you know. But wanting something and actually doing it, two different things, right? And I had a long way to go. And I felt like throughout my junior career, I was always trying to play catch up. I was always behind. Started later. Uh, by the time I got to nationals, a lot of kids had been playing them for four or five years. And I, it was my first time when I was 14, you know, and, you know, got to Kalamazoo finally. And, you know, I was happy to be there. And then Next thing I know, my, my last year, I made the semifinals. So I finally caught up a little bit to the, the top level juniors. Then I went to college and it's kind of the same thing again. It's like you kind of just work your way through the crowd that's up in front of you and you start chasing them down one, at a, one after another. And so by the time I finished in college, I was an All-American my final year. So in every stage, you try to conquer that stage that's in front of you. And that's why I tell my players all the time, let's 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 dominate this level and then let's move up to the next level. And so I was able to kind of get to a good place and being in Atlanta, uh, being able to spar with some guys that were on the tour that would come in and practice with us, play sets with us, you know, every once in a while, my freshman, sophomore year, I'm getting just tuned up by those guys, six, one, six, one, six, two, by my junior senior year. Now I'm actually winning some sets every once in a while. So, you know, you start to have that belief that, hey, I'm on to something here. This serve I have is legit. Right. And even these top guys are having a hard time dealing with it. If I can hit my spot consistently and I can follow that up, I can hold serve. If I can hold serve against these guys, maybe I can make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I started by my senior year, started having that feeling like, hey, there's this is a real, real legitimate opportunity that I have in front of me. And so I started seeing it for what it really was. So you had a magical run to Wimbledon, right? So this is a timely conversation. And, you know, I always marvel at how hard it is to win one match at a Grand Slam, especially Wimbledon. And so you look at people's results and they say, okay, third round of Wimby, third round US Open, third round, like, ah, whatever. I'm like, no, that's, that's hard to do. It right. Is. And I remember talking to Corey Goff, Coco's dad. This was last year. He's like, oh, well, you know, she didn't been in third round of every slam. And, you know, and I was like, well, Corey, let me just tell you, don't take that for granted because exactly. fourth round to semis is like a whole nother tournament. It's like two tournaments, week one, week two. So don't take that for granted how hard it is and how different it is. So tell me about that run because you got to the fourth round of Wimbledon, right, in 94. But that's not hard to do, and not many brothers have done that. Right, right. What went yes. right? It was pretty special, man, because if you back up just a little bit, I had, I had just come off a little bit of a losing streak, you know, before for Wimbledon. And so my ranking was weekly, just kind of doing one of these deals, you know? <laughs> it was going down, you know, week after week after week with these first round losses um, through the French Open and even after the French. And so I find myself in 94 after being in the main draw probably two or three years in a row prior to that being back in the qualifying. Hmm. So I made that run having to go through the quality, so win three extra matches there. Right. But those three matches 
got me on a winning streak again. And mm -hmm. so by the time I got through the third one, I'm telling you, I went from a guy with low confidence to a guy in a week's time that was supremely confident. And, you know, through that losing streak, I had worked my tail off. And that's what people don't understand either. You can be losing and doing the right things, just not quite getting the results yet. Right. And so sometimes two, three, four months of work doesn't show up right away. It takes some time. And so I got through the qualifying and then I get my draw. I'm playing the number two seed first round, Kamal, Michael Steak. Mm. And uh, we're playing on what they call the graveyard court, court number two. Mm. And uh, so I go out on the court and I knew something he didn't know because he had a big old grin on his face when we're up at the net with the, with the cheer umpire. And uh, before he tossed the, you know, the coin and decide who's going to serve first or whatever, I saw the grin on, on Michael's face and I thought he has no idea what's coming today. <laughs> and uh, it's one of those times as a pro, I mean, you're, you're humble, you're humbled all the time, right? You go out there and it's just you and it's a great player on the other side of the net and uh, it's tough to, to pile up wins. Um, if you're batting 500, you're doing well out there on the tour. And so we start the match and sure enough, I mean, I'm seeing the ball from the very opening bell, like it's a grapefruit. And uh, I beat the guy three, three, and four. You know, mm. he's number two seed at Wimbledon, number two in the world. And uh, and then from there, the confidence just kept rolling, you know, into the next rounds. And I found myself, you know, in the fourth round of Wimbledon. And, you know, when you're playing in the second week of a slam, there's nothing like it. All of a sudden, that locker room thins out a little <laughs> bit. The, the cafeteria is lighter. Yeah. All, easier all to get boy, tickets. All, yeah. All the locker room attendants know you and they're right. cheering for you and like giving you a little dap here and there. Like, you know, you're my man. Come on, let's go. Right, right. right. And, and, you, and you're feeling all that love and, and uh, you know, it's pretty special. It didn't happen to me very often, obviously, throughout my career, but to experience it there at Wimbledon. You know, it was it was it was amazing. Have my family there and supporting me and get to share in that experience of kind of being at the very top of the game, uh, even if it's for a moment. You know, it's it's pretty special. Now, it's funny because in your time, it probably wasn't worth millions. But now fourth round of Wimbledon, we've seen Emirata Kanu last year, fourth round of Wimbledon worth 100 million. You know what I mean? Right. You, know, you, you start the tournament with 10,000 followers, you end the tournament with a million followers. You know what right. I mean? It's just, right. you know, when people hear fourth round, I don't think that they understand in today's world, fourth round, like Coco winning what fourth round, you right. know, a couple right. years ago when she beat Venus and went on and right. Emma, that's right. like 100 million bucks. Absolutely. For the fourth round. Absolutely. You know, so amazing. It's just it's amazing. I wish I could have some of that money. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, let me ask you, because Wimbledon I always find is like the holy grail of our sport, right? I think U.S. Open is the Super Bowl of our sport, but the holy grail of our sport is Wimbledon. And I always ask this question, would you rather play on court 18 or court three? Oh, wow. Wow. And a lot of people don't know. If you haven't been there, and like, yes. and to play, they're yes. like, yes. Court three. Yes. I'm like, eh. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on 18. I'm yeah. with you on 18. That's pretty special over there, man. You, you're not right. You're not wrong. That is you're not you wrong. Got, you got the TV studios on one side. Right. You got the people up on the rooftop looking down. Mm -hmm. You know, the bowl on three is OK because the players can look at you. from. Yeah, they're looking over the, the restaurant yeah. and the railing on that side. And that's kind of nice. I remember one year watching. Uh, I think it was another year that Michael Steak actually won at Wimbledon. And he was playing a first round match and I'm looking over the railing. He's playing this Russian guy named Alexander Volkov. Volkov had match point, had a running, uh, running backhand pass and it hit the net or, or Steak had a running backhand pass. It hit the net and kind of hooked back in the court. And he turned that match around, ended up winning it and then won Wimbledon that year. Oh. So it's pretty cool when all the players over there watching you on court two, three and, you know, that, that little section over there is pretty cool. But it's funny, when you look at the schedule, you talk about the graveyard. Court two is disrespectful. Like, if, you, if you're a top player, yes. I'll take center, I'll take court yes. one, I'll yes. take court three and court 18. But yeah. court two is kind of like, eh. It is. It eh. is. <laughs> you know, <it's>, that's a <laughs> good place for an upset, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good place for an upset. You're kind of hiding over there. That's right. So 
I remember 2017 when Sloan was making a run to the U.S. Open. I, that was the most stressful. And I've had some stressful weeks, right? I remember trying to build a center, having a stroke in Alabama, trying to do a lot. But I remember that year was the most stressful two weeks of my life because you are responsible for, you know, you look at the draw to being in a tournament, you see some opportunities, right? And it's your job to sort of help them not mess it up. Right. Yeah. So, you know, don't eat the wrong food, yeah. right? And get food poisoning. Don't get the wrong practice partner. Don't yeah. cut it too close in traffic. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah. like yeah. you're responsible. And I felt every win, I got more and more stressed out. I remember just coming back to the hotel and like staying in the shower and sitting on the shower floor for like 30 minutes with the hot water running over your head. Cause it was like relief that you made it out of another round, right? Yeah. And then you got, you know, the slams, you get a day off in between, but that time goes quick for scouting and setting it up and that kind of thing. So it's a whole different level of stress being a coach. So when you were coaching Mal and it got to the Wimbledon final in 1996, how did that compare to you playing and what the level of stress that was involved? Oh man, it's, it's totally different when you're trying to care for somebody else. <laughs> and uh, and you're living and dying with with how they perform and stuff, and you don't have total control. You can just help with the preparation, and hope that you've done a good enough job and taking care of all those little things that make a difference in the end of the day, and yeah. that maybe only you know about. You yeah. know that you've done. Uh, there's so many subtle things. I mean, you talked about practice partners and getting the right ones that are going to keep them in the right frame of mind and then setting up the practice the right way and knowing what not to say, knowing when to be quiet, knowing when to say something, know when to keep it light, know when to inject something that may be beneficial and helpful tactically. You know, it's like all those little nuances of coaching that, that actually mean more than just, I mean, it's, it's one thing having knowledge. Right. And wanting to just give all that, but you can't give a player too much. Right. You got to find out how they, how they are going to take that information and whether there, it's a good time to take it. And so all those decisions that you make, you know, uh, Mal, I mean, he's, he's probably one of the easiest guys anyone could ever work with because he doesn't put that extra pressure on you. You know, he knows it's a team effort and uh, he's just a cool cat, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, he's pretty relaxed about things. Um, he wants to be organized. He wants you to be organized. He wants you to make sure that you're doing things professionally, but at the end of the day, he understands he's the guy that's got to, got to execute the plays. And, um, and so, yeah, as a coach, you just, you just do your best, like you said, and you, and you try to put them in a position where they can be successful and express their talent and go out there and play freely and, and, and go out there and enjoy the experience. Because if they do, you know what they're capable of. You know what Sloan's capable of, right? Right. I mean, she, she can dominate. You get her in the right space, in the right place. I mean, there's no one better. And so that's kind of how I felt with Mal. It's like, there's not an athlete here better than this guy. I watched this guy for a full year, practice with anyone in the world, anyone, Agassi, Chang, any of those guys, after 10 minutes of hitting the ball, they're picking up six balls on their side of the net. My man doesn't hit a ball in the net. Right. This guy could go a year without missing a ball in the net. And I credit his dad for that, you know? Yeah. I mean, he was just locked in. And uh, so some pretty special, special athletes you and I have had, a, had an opportunity to work with. So what do you think was the difference in that tournament? Because I always say the difference in a, in a deep run at a slam is probably – one match where you should have lost that you didn't, right? A little luck on your side, lucky bounce, lucky line call, whatever. Somebody missed a call or something off the court. Like I can remember just decisions. You know what? I'm looking at back at like a French over like it was a good decision to stay at this hotel. It was quiet. It was this. We got rooms next to each other. The, the, the restaurant was closed. And that, I think, had an impact on the calmness of which we were able to function. Off the court. What do you think had a big impact during that Wimbledon run in 96 for Mal? No, I think Mal, Mal's just, uh, you know, he's so simple. And I think the thing when I was working with him, it was just like, don't complicate anything. And so whether it was just simple dinners, 
I just remember just going to the same restaurants and just having simple food, just being comfortable, no distractions, just very, very clean and simple. And, and he just went out there and stayed relaxed because of that. And so I think that was the biggest thing is just putting them in a relaxing place. But the thing that was special about Mal is that this guy's game was based around the baseline. But you ask him to do some little things that he wasn't necessarily comfortable with, and he would do them and do them in critical situations. You're thinking, <laughs> how many people have the guts to do this stuff? Yeah. You no, know, to get outside their comfort zone, knowing that I'm playing on grass. And so I'm going to have to do these other things, you know? Right. And I think that that's one of the things that I think made him just really unique to work with is his ability to do that. But you're right, those off court things and those things that, that make a difference. Uh, some of those matches that he played and got through, uh, it seems like it was a long time ago, but it feels also like it was yesterday, you know, seeing him get through some of those situations. So, you know, he's, he's a stud of studs though, that guy. Oh yeah. So you, you, you stopped coaching Mal and you decided to come off tour and coach college. How did that go about? Was it Mal's career kind of winding down or were you tired of traveling, wanting to start a family? I mean, all well, these I yeah, I was I was coupling a couple of things because I was when I was working with Mal, I was also working for the USTA. So I was doing some things with some of the younger talent as well. And but I was on the on the road a lot of weeks and it was time for me to kind of settle down. You know, I wasn't married at the time. And so, you know, it's something that I wanted to do um, with the right woman. And, and I found the right woman and uh, we had kids. And so the, the college thing kind of came up and grabbed me, you know, Kenny Thorne, who was at Georgia Tech, he came in one day and said, uh, you know, I'd love for you to come down here and work with me. You know, there's a, there's a job opening for the women's coach here. And I know you haven't probably ever thought about that, but I'd love for you to come and meet with our AD a guy named Dave brain and talk with them about the job. And, and, and you can start thinking about what your vision would be for the job. And, and let's see if those things match up. And so reluctantly, I, I went in there and met with him uh, a couple of times and he convinced me to, to take the job. And, um, you know, I was there for 13 years, Kamau. I never thought I'd be there for two, you right. know, but <laughs> 13 years, you know, at Georgia Tech and, you know, took a team that was kind of the last team in the ACC and uh, got them all the way to a national championship um, and just built it brick by brick. Cause I thought when I came in, I got a name and I've got some game right. and I'm going to be able to pull these kids in one after another. These top national kids did not happen. Right. It's like, no, no, you're going to have to start with this group right here and prove yourself. Let's mm -hmm. see if you can take this group and do something with them. Mm -hmm. So that group got better over time two, three years, that group started competing, started getting to the middle of the ACC, making the NCAA tournaments. All of a sudden we start winning around here too, you know? And then I started getting a little bit better kids. I, I really focused in on the Midwest. The Midwest was my hunting ground. And so I was in Ohio and I was in Illinois and I was in Michigan and I was in these states where these blue collar kids that didn't get to play 12 months out of the year all the time because of indoor prices and stuff like that. So I was pulling these kids from the Midwest and man, I hit, I hit gold. I hit gold. This kid, Christy Miller and Allison Silverio and, and on and on and on. I hit all these great kids that were kind of, their potential wasn't even close to being tapped. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came in and worked, they worked for me and they were high character kids and helped us take the program to the very top of the game in college tennis. And I'm telling you, it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever been a part of to take a team from the bottom to the top. Um, I always say there's nothing that can compare with what you do as an individual versus a team. Because mm -hmm. I've done it as an individual for a long time. And now I've been able to work as part of a team and there's nothing like it. You know, the success that you share, even even some of the losses that you share together are richer than the ones that you share alone. And so, you know, as, as now you talk to all these pros, they talk about their team, right? Right. It's much better with the team than it is out there trying to do it on your own. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible. 
So the village or that team that you have around you, you working together, now nah, that's something special, you know? And so I was fortunate that Kenny pulled me into college tennis, um, that they gave me that opportunity, take that opportunity and parlay that into putting a great program together of a lot of people working collectively together for a common goal and helping people develop and, and get better on the court, off the court as people first and then tennis players and students next. Uh, pretty special to be a part of it, especially 17 and 22. Those are, these are golden years, man. Yeah. These are the years that you're formulating all kinds of things. And to be a part of that, woo, it's something special, man. It really is. Yeah, I always say uh, tennis is an individual sport, but at every level it's a team game, right? At the younger ages, you got a fundamental coach. The kids got to do their part. The parents got to commit to getting them there and yes, sitting sir. through the lessons where the kids swinging and missing. You know, then at the pro level, you know, you got the physio, the trainer, the parent, the agent. It's like, guys, yes. well, let's let's make sure the press is on the right day. Let's not have it interfere with practice. Let's not, yes. you know, let's get the right deals and the right indoor. It's, it's like always a team. No one does this. By the time that player walks on the court, 10 different people have like had a hand in what's about to happen. And exactly. once you get that synergy, it's a special thing. So you're yeah. one of the only coaches or the only coach to win a men's title and a women's title. What similarities that those two teams have that made them win, right? Because, you know, you look at schools like UCLA, Stanford, every year are stacked, but don't always win. So what's in common between that Georgia Tech women's team and that Florida men's team that helped them win the title? Man, they're dogs. I mean, I had, I had, I had eight, nine kids deep that all were hungry. I mean, hungry. And so it's not like hungry, like, yeah, I'm a little hungry. No, no. Day after day to get out there in the heat and do the work. I'm tired. Let's do five more. Okay. At the end of the rep, let's, let's add another one. Right. You know, it's just like day after day, let's add one more. Okay, let's go. And it's not coming from me, but they start driving one another. And I think those two teams that we had that, that uh, got to that level, uh, pretty special individuals among the group that pushed one another. I remember that team in 2007 that won at Georgia Tech. Uh, we were in Athens to play UCLA in the final. But uh, back in the fall of that year, we were doing a workout in the gym and at the end of the workout, we were doing wall sits. And if anyone knows what a wall sit is, you, you get your back up against the wall and your, your knees are at 90 degrees and you just hold it right there. Okay. A minute in, let's see who drops first. There's, there's nine kids there. All of a sudden one's out. Okay. Eight more left. All right. They're holding on, holding on, holding on. Another one's out. It gets finally down to two kids and we're at like the three, to four minute mark and they're quivering like this their legs are shaking and one of the girls looks over at the other girl she's like stop it give up give up and she's screaming finally somebody wins somebody loses but i mean the depth that they would go to and, and that's the thing that i always said is like if you can get a team like that that we had at georgia tech to love to compete every single day and not fear it and that's why I told our, our, our ladies, I said, we're going to compete. I know it's not always popular to get these get together and put you in competitive situations with one another all the time. But guess what? If we're able to do that and no other programs out there are willing to compete and practice every day, if we're the team that can do that because we're strong enough mentally, that we're strong enough emotionally to handle that and still be friends, because you know how it is, Kamal. Yeah know how it is yeah. you know that's a delicate situation and you got to manage it and and i don't I, I give you props for managing it the way you do because it is an art form to be able to sell certain things and be able to get people to do those things without giving up part of their soul and mm -hmm. so that was pretty special about that team and the same thing with this team here at florida is like they're willing to compete day in and day out push one another and when you can go there, you're going deeper and you're going to get more out of it. And so when you get to the end of the season and it's us against them, that was the best because we're not beating each other up anymore. We, we go go fight someone else. 
and and then they'd let loose and and it was just like I remember we lost the doubles point against UCLA and my, one of my leaders, we got in the huddle. There's five minutes between the doubles point and the singles when it starts out. So we lost the doubles point. We're down 1-0. We got six singles about to start. I have what I want to say in the huddle. My senior leader, Captain, she starts talking. She talks for like two minutes and she's just, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. After she was done, we put our hands in the huddle. I didn't say a word. And I didn't say a word all night. <laughs> you know, I could sit back and watch these guys perform and it was special, you know, and I felt the same way when we won the championship last year in Orlando. You know, I had a team that took control and they wouldn't be stopped. So let me ask you this. This is a trick question. So everyone always asks me, what's the difference between coaching men's teams and women's teams or men and women? And I, I've said, and I've, you know, I've coached team tennis, right? Yes. I mean, friends yes. with men on the tour, obviously yes. coach women. And the way I say it, and I say, I try to say it as eloquently as possible. I say men's tennis, I'm looking at 10 situations on the court to try to manage maybe three situations off the court. <laughs> I know where you're going. And women's tennis, I'm looking at three scenarios on the court that we need to be prepared for and 10 scenarios off the court that we need to control. Um, so that would be my experience. You know, that would be my experience, my sort of summation on it, right? Man is like, you know, sir, first ball, what if this, what if that? There's, you know, because there's just a lot of different variety of things you can control at different times and scores in the match, right? Right. Um, and the women, I think it's a little simpler, right? You know, people kind of are who they are. They don't have very few players can chip, can drop, can lock, and you know, they can do that. It's just simpler. And the right. other sport is more important to control. What yeah. would you say the difference is in coaching the men's team and the women's team? I think you're exactly right. I think I could spend more time off the court with the women's team and spend more time on the court with the men's team. More time actually acting and doing things versus talking about things and getting things situated so that mentally and emotionally they're in a good place and they feel like they're able to go out there and be effective and, and have confidence and belief in what they do. Because you know, the belief part for me is the most important part. You know, if they have that belief in themselves and they walk out there with that, that's their secret weapon, man. I mean, that is a weapon. And so to get the females to a place where they have that and they feel empowered mm -hmm. to go out there and express the talent that they have when they're in that zone, whew, it's, it's special. Right. And so it takes a little bit more of that time, but 70% of that time needs to be spent off the court, you know, and less of the time on the court. Uh, but, you know, the teams I had at Georgia tech, I think were pretty special because, you know, they all wrote in their journals every day. Uh, and, and that was something they enjoyed doing, like putting into words the things that they were feeling and what they were going through when they're at their best, what's going on in their mind, what's going on off the court, what's happening in their life that's producing better results for themselves. And they could go back through their journal and look back and see when it was going well, what was I thinking? Where was I at? What was going on in my life? And they can go back and find those places and then, OK, that's I need to get back to that. Right. And if you as a coach can help them get back to that, then they can find that that joy to go out there and, and practice and play and compete and do all the things they do. And, and people hate that question. But I look at like I, I, the way I look at it, I say, OK, women make fewer errors. Yes. And they try less dumb stuff. Yes. And then when you look at like some of the guys, right, like I always say, like some of the young guys, right, you look at like a young Tommy Paul, a young Francis. Yes. Right. They have probably more tools, can, you know, can use the bottom edge of the racket and the top of the racket. They make more errors and they do more dumb stuff. Right. And they, they try more <laughs> things when they actually just needed to let's make this ball. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think like just from a tennis standpoint, the women are more controlled. Right. It's easier to control the level on the court, not in a sexist way. They just don't have these bright ideas. Right. Like having a certain body the whole match. And that five all do some a certain body. Like, no, that was a bad idea. 
You know what I mean? So it's less of that. So it's actually easier on the yeah. court that I yeah, feel. I, I also felt like, you know, on the women's side, they listen better. Yep. They yep. listen better. I mean, I could say it one time. This is what we're going to do. I go out on the court, tell them what we're going to do. They're ready to do it. You tell a guy what we're going to do and go out to the line. He's like, what are we doing? Right. What's the drill? <laughs> I mean, are yeah. you not listening? Not a, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have to repeat it. You know, I, was, I said it once already. We weren't yeah. listening, though. But on the women's side, they just listen better. Yeah. You know, with the guys, like my guys, I, I laugh all the time with them. I'm like, I had to bring my shovel out here and, and smack you over the head so that right, you right. listen, you know. But no, it's, uh, it's a little bit different that way. They're just a little bit more attentive. Uh, we go through video sessions and they're really paying attention to the details of, of what they're doing. And sometimes the guys are, their minds wandering a little bit. So you got to kind of rein them back in a little bit. So I got a funny story. So Tommy Paul always, we spent two weeks together around Thanksgiving last year, team tennis. And he was, he was actually thinking about going to college. Yeah. And right. didn't get offered a full ride from North Carolina. Okay. So he didn't go, he didn't, he didn't get to go to the school he wanted to go to. Right. And that's why he turned pro. Wow. In your years, who have you missed? Who have you like recruited and probably oh like God. under offered or didn't go hard after and was like, damn, I should have went and got it right. <laughs> who have you like missed the mark on? Oh my gosh. I mean, how many, how many have I but missed? I mean, <laughs> We were just talking about that this morning. I, I just hired a new associate head coach, uh, Matt Clore, and oh, Matt's yeah, coming, Matt. coming from the USTA. And we were just talking about guys that we've missed on in the past. You know, right? Some, I'm not going to be. I'm, I'm kind of insulted. You didn't send me the email and offer me the job. Damn! At least I should get an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you gonna come work for me? <laughs> come on, come out. <laughs> I pick up balls. I make sure the boys don't steal it all the shoes out the out the storage room. But come on, man. I, I can be a good team player. I would be, a, we be, a, we be a dynamic duo one day. One day, <laughs> now, you and I. We gotta, all we right. Gotta, we got to line up together on the same team. All right. The world, y'all hear it now. And I, I will submit. You are in charge. I'm just. <laughs> There was, a guy recently, there was a guy recently who, uh, who I, I didn't take a look at, and uh, he's now playing. He's probably two to 300 in the world. His name's Roberto Sid. But when I first got to Florida, uh, I heard this stuff about this kid, and, and I just said, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to pass on him. And literally, he went to South Florida which is about two hours down the road. So all of our tournaments we'd host and they'd come in and play us and we play them in the postseason. I mean, for four years, this guy wore us out. He played <laughs> number one for them and he just beat us and beat us and beat us. And I always thought he wanted to come to Florida. This, this joker, his dream was to come play for us. And then his dream became to come and beat us. Right. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty. There's a long list come out. I mean, it's it's hard, and you don't have that crystal ball to know, you know, just how good or what's inside the heart of some of these kids. Yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of great ones that have come through that we have missed on, but we we've, we've been fortunate to be right on some as well. So let me tell you, how do you have the conversation? Because you know, I always find when you coach at a national championship school. You're recruiting every year, recruiting probably one or two guys every year as one or two guys sort of matriculate out. Those guys probably have pro aspirations. And, you know, me as a coach, people always say, hey, I, you know, come out, come take a look at my kid. This kid might be top five in the country, 80 ITF, whatever it is. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, not going to make it, right? right? Or don't have a shot. Right. How do you have the conversation with guys who – perhaps maybe underestimate what it's like to make it on tour, right? Where you and your mind know college will be the last stop. There's yeah. probably no pro potential. Or do you even bother to have the conversation and you let time just sort of tell itself? Most, most of the time, I, I don't, don't have that conversation. I, I hate to be the one that, that takes someone's dreams and says, you know, you can't do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of people that told me that, you know, you know what, Brian? You, 
you, you, you're not going to make it if you're trying to go to a school like Georgia Tech and you want to play professional tennis at the end of that. You're going to have to put too much time in studying. Right. I mean, you're going to be engineering student, you know, and you're going to try to do tennis at the same time. And there's other people that are only doing tennis right now. How are you going to do it? Right. So I don't like to put limitations on anyone. So I let it kind of evolve naturally. Mm -hmm. If they ask my opinion, I, I tell them that, hey, I feel like this is the best pathway for your growth. You're 145, 150 pounds right now. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have these skills, but you don't have a real weapon to hurt people at the next level. We can, we can develop some of those things, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And, uh, you know, and I think it's, it's also the job of kind of the USTA, um, to be able to look at those players and help them with that decision-making process and understanding, you know, which player is probably the best option is to go to school, mm -hmm. you know, and continue to develop, pick the right school, pick right. a place where you're going to continue to get better and get stronger physically. And, and you're going to mature as a person. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to, to different players back in the day that, that were turned pro right away, like Courier and Chang and those guys. And, they, they look back and go, I wish I had had a couple of years in college, right. you know, and these are guys yeah. that made it, you know, made it. Yeah. so, you know, like I said, like I say to my son too, it's like, Hey, the pro tour is going to be there. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, you know, it's, it's you, keep focusing, you keep focusing in on being you enjoying this experience, making the most out of it, developing your game, um, perfecting your craft, and stay locked into that. All that other stuff will come to you, okay? You don't have to go chase it. You just lock in and stay stay committed to, to being the best version of yourself every single day. And you do that, good things will happen. You got the talent. I know it, you know? So just stay locked in. Don't listen to the noise. Don't listen to what everyone else is saying. You stay locked into our little group right here and uh, stay insulated with that. And you just do your thing, enjoy your experience and make the most out of it. That's it. So you, you brought up your son and your daughter now I heard is transferring from South Carolina to Florida as well. And I was on, a, I did a cast podcast with Rick Macy oh, wow. and Nick Saviano. Okay. And we all talked about how we've coached so many kids. They've gotten so many scholarships. They plan yeah. on tour and our kids don't play. Right. And my daughter plays. She's just OK. Right. OK. Nick's kids don't play. Rick Macy was like, yeah, I, I let them go around and get water. It never came back to the court. And I knew they didn't want to play. Right. <laughs> we screwed it up. How did you get your kids a to want to play and b to play at that level? Did you coach them? Did you let somebody else do it? I, I countless coaches build great players, but can't build their own kids. That's true. So how did you do it? Well, it was, uh, I think my time at Georgia Tech helped because my daughter's the oldest. She's 18 months older than my son. And uh, she would come to the courts and see me working with the players on the team. And these are players that she immediately took to, you know, wanted to be like. And so for her, she saw all that. And she's like, I'd love to be one of those players. And she saw that the respect that they had for me as a coach and the respect that their parents had for me as well as a coach. And so she looked at that and I think she wanted to emulate and have that same type of relationship with her father, mm -hmm. you know, even as a, not just daughter, daddy, but, but player coach. And so she was the first one to say, hey, can I come out there with you? Will you teach me the game? And uh, so I did. And I also had some other coaches working with her um, that she would go to clinics and get some like group activity mm -hmm. with and stuff like that. So it was so it was good for her social development as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was kind of the primary coach with her. And my son was like, mm -mm, not me. I'm not going to play tennis. Tennis okay. will not be my sport. I mean, he said it proudly for years. And uh, so he was playing football and he was playing basketball and he was playing everything else, soccer. And he wasn't involved in tennis uh, the whole time we were in Atlanta. Um, and then we moved to, to Florida, to Gainesville here. And um, 
he was probably nine. She was going on 11 and she was really starting to play tournaments. And so she'd go with my wife to a tournament on the weekend and come back with a trophy or something. He kind of look at her and go, Hmm, good for you, you know? And, but tennis still wasn't going to be his sport. And then he was doing football. Football was his main thing as a quarterback, very good arm, you know, good leader out there on the court. I mean, on, on the field. And uh, he had a lot of the intangibles to be a really good football player. And um, he got hit. He got hit. I think it's like 11 or 12 years old. And he got hit one time. And that night, he said, you know what, dad, I, I was thinking that maybe <laughs> next year I'd, I'd take a year off from football and I'd start, I'd start, uh, start playing tennis with me and Emma. What do you think? <laughs> He's going to kill me for telling you that. I don't think I've ever told anyone that, oh, but, uh, but you know, I said, uh, uh-huh, okay. So I right. knocked some sense into the kid. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Literally. Literally. <laughs> so, you know, in the way we did it, you know, we did it dark and early, man. It was like, oh, dark 30, you know? So we got up early, 5.30 in the morning. We're at the courts at six and, you know, quick breakfast and go. And we get a couple hours in because they're in regular school. We didn't, we didn't have them homeschool or online or any of that stuff. They're in regular school. So I had to get that in with them before I started with the team every day. So my daughter and I had been doing that for, for about a year. And then, so he started joining in and we just started doing it. And it was like, if you want to play tennis with me, you got to you got to do these things, the attitude, all these things got to be in place. And then you'll have the opportunity to come out and work with us in the morning. And I told I told Ben the same thing. Your sister's she's focused. She's right. dialed in. Don't mess around. Don't, don't come in here and mess that up. Right. right. <laughs> so he tried to mess it up, but because uh, <laughs> you know, he's a boy. And he, he didn't want to drill. He wanted to play. He wanted to compete. He wanted to just play sets right off the bat. You know, I'm like, yeah. you have to learn some technical things, son. You got to learn how to make some balls first. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, you know, a rewarding time, man. You know, you say, you know, having special time with your kids. No one else is around. It's just us uh, turning on the lights to go play tennis early in the morning. Uh, and we kind of had that, uh, that saying, you know, no one else is out here right now. It's just us. We're getting right. better than everybody else that's still sleeping. Everyone else is still in bed and you guys are out here hitting balls. Um, so nothing better than that. And we did it year after year after year after year until she went off to school. Um, and they would hit on their own together in the afternoon. So they just had each other and, and me and, and they, the, the best time for them was when they got to go play tournaments and go play the other kids. Um, now, would you say, would you say that the time he spent, well, off the, not on the tennis court, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, all those things made it easy. He developed the athletic skills that you don't oh necessarily gosh. develop on a tennis court. Oh my gosh. And then the easy part is seasons might have to hit a ball. I always say like, you don't have to start at seven. If you're doing something between seven and 10, learn how to change direction, jump, you know, track, all that kind of stuff. I can teach you how to hit a ball, yeah. right? And so it's interesting that he starts playing that late, then win, wins NCAAs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it is, it is. And I just said, you know, I'd rather take an athlete and turn him into a tennis player than have a tennis player and try to make him an athlete later. You know, it's like develop that athletic skill at a young age. And so all those things that you're doing in those other sports – they all come together and, in in you know, playing tennis. I mean, his serve, throwing the football, throwing the baseball. Right. I mean, it's natural, you know, I mean, going up for an overhead, that right. ball goes up, man. He's, he's salivating, you know, he's like going up and he's going to go up strong and athletic, you know? And so there are certain things that just translate hustle, playing football. You don't hustle. The coach got you running yeah. laps out in the yeah. sun or he's, he's letting somebody take a hit on you or whatever. It's just like, no, you don't make that mistake. You know, this is what we do, you know, and you're held accountable. And so you're learning a lot of other lessons along the way in those sports that are going to help apply to tennis for sure. So, you know, I had a lot of good teachers for, for him, especially because my daughter kind of, she just navigated to, to tennis and was a little bit more of a narrow focus. And he was doing a lot of different things. So it's interesting to see, you know, how they both have gotten to a good level 
going two different routes, but I think his athleticism is something that stands, stands apart when he's playing tennis. Now, my last question, I'm told you got a funny Tiger Woods story. Oh yeah. Always. <laughs> Always. I, I still, I mean, I'm, I'm 56 years old come out and people still come up to me if I've got my Nike uh, golf clothes on or whatever. And they're like, Tiger Woods. <laughs> so we were, we were, uh, I was working for the USTA and we were in a hotel getting ready to go to a dinner um, with a bunch of coaches uh, down in Key Biscayne. And uh, we're staying in Miami. And, uh, and so we come down to the lobby of the hotel and there was a prom. It was prom night, you know, in Miami. And so all these kids came into the hotel all dressed up uh, in their tuxes and their dresses. And there was a group of probably like 12 kids and they saw us over talking uh, as a group of coaches. And one of the kids screams, oh my gosh, it's Tiger Woods. <laughs> Comes running over and says, Tiger, would you sign this for me? And so I just start, start <laughs> signing Tiger Woods. Tiger, 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 Tiger. <laughs> so I'm signing autographs, you know, <laughs> impersonating Tiger Woods. So I probably get in a little trouble for that, but, uh, all right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we're not all Tiger. <laughs> oh, man. Well, look, man, I appreciate the time that you spent with us. Um, we all are rooting for you. We all are in admiration of not what you've done for other kids and other programs, but how you've been able to produce two great tennis players that come from you. Because coaches know how hard that is to, to not take it home and to have it ruin the family dynamic and the right. kid eventually quits and hates it and resents you right? Uh, and that kind of thing. So, you know, you are a, a model citizen for the game and really a role model for all of us young coaches coming up. And let me tell you, next time you have an opening, if I don't get an email or an interview, <laughs> I'm going to make sure that. I tell every good player I see at Junior Wimbledon, don't even look at Florida. It's the worst <laughs> school in the country. <laughs> hey, Come out. We got one spot open for next year. You need to make a plug for me, man. We got I, some I, I money. Got we got some scholarship. We just need one more good one for next year. So, right. you, you know, make sure you get the word out for me. All right. <laughs> it's I keep a village, eye. right? It's a village, right? Yeah. Well, this has been the Tennis.com podcast with Brian Shelton, uh, the only coach in this NCAA history to win the men's and the women's title. So thank you so much for your time, Brian, and we'll continue to root for you. Thanks, Kamal. All the best. Thank you, brother.